Well, thank you very much, and it's, uh, it's great to be here with you, and it's, uh, it's great to be a part of this, of this conference and to be able to talk about uh, a subject that uh, I like very much and is very, a very, very important part of my uh, entire uh, academic career. And I was given the task of talking about linguistic schools. And so uh, linguistic schools, very important. And I think uh, as we talk about it, I hope that you will get a little bit of a sense of how important they are as we think about uh, this notion of, of Greek. Because we tend to have what I consider a, a positivist view uh, of Greek. We view Greek as a thing. It's an ancient language, so it must be rather static in how we understand it. And so as a result, we often have what I would call pre-descriptive views of what Greek is. Uh, but I don't think that that's uh, actually accurate at all. And the case in point uh, would be, in fact, the study of verbal aspect that has happened over the years. As some of you will know the history of that discussion, there was a time when people tended to believe that all of the tense forms in Greek were primarily temporal. They referred to time. And then a little bit later, some people came along and said, no, 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 it's not something to do with time. It has something more to do with how the action occurred. And some of you will be familiar with the term "actions art uh, as used to describe what is going on with the tense forms. And then later, others came along and made the point that, no, no, we think we've kind of got that wrong, and that, as, that uh, the Greek language is primarily aspectual, and it's essentially an aspectual rather than a temporal language. One of the things you tend to see in that history of discussion is that the interpreters of Greek tended to view Greek as sort of a form of their own language. So many of the early describers of Greek were German scholars. German scholarship is very, very important in the history of Greek language discussion. And German language tends to be a heavily temporal language. And so lo and behold, Greek became a very temporal language. When English scholars got involved, we know that English is sort of, if you have a Klein, it's sort of halfway between time and aspect, sort of a mixed language in some ways. And some are arguing more and more, there are aspectual, more and more aspectual features of English. And lo and behold, then English became looking a lot more like a language that had something to do with kind of action in the description. Well, what that tells us is that linguistic models are essential to what we're trying to do in describing a language so that we avoid simply reading our own understanding of the world, especially our understanding of our own language, into the description of Greek. Because the whole field of linguistics is a little odd this way in that you use the very thing that you're examining to describe what you're examining, right? You're using language to talk about language. So the tendency is to talk in your own language about that other language. So linguistic models are very, very important. And linguistic schools are groups of people who associate around these kinds of linguistic models. And so what I would like to do is to introduce you to some of the linguistic models, the major linguistic models that are being used in contemporary New Testament Greek study. And this will be a little bit different than we're used to in biblical studies, because biblical studies as a discipline tends to be very eclectic. Right? And so most biblical scholars, they will just kind of grab anything they can as it comes along. So literary criticism comes, and then social scientific, and we ought to do canon, and we ought to do this and that. We just kind of all bring it together. You're a form critic, or a source critic, or a this critic, or a that critic. It's all together in one. The field of linguistics is actually quite a bit different from that. And it's much more exclusive in the kinds of models. Not to say that there isn't some overlap, but there are actually some things that have been called by some the linguistic wars, because there has been great opposition between various schools of thought. And it, in, in some of these wars have even been wars within certain schools of thought. And so they are trying to parse exactly who they are, what they're doing, in a way that biblical studies uh, does not. So let's talk about what are linguistic schools. Well, in 1980, a scholar by the name, a linguist by the name of uh, Jeffrey Sampson wrote a book called Schools of Linguistics, which is a good place to, to start if you're going to talk about something like this. 
And he describes linguistic schools in this way. He says, quoting him, Often one individual or a small group of original minds has founded a tradition which has continued to mold approaches to language in the university or the nation in which that tradition began. Between adherents of different traditions, there has usually been relatively limited contact. And so what I've used as a definition of a linguistic school, generally speaking, there's a few little exceptions, is that you need to have at least a couple of sort of significant linguistic monographs that have sort of paved the way, and then a couple of monographs usually in biblical studies that have picked that up and used it uh, in some way. Now, I realize that by using that as a definition, I'm going to exclude people who maybe have written primarily in some journal articles or the one-off kind of person uh, who is doing work. But I've taken the notion of a linguistic school, meaning more than just one person sitting in the schoolroom alone, uh, the idea that you have a, a relatively full classroom. And so um, I'm going to talk in terms of these schools that I've identified. And I'm going to not deal with some of the peripheral things that grow out of these schools. So I'm not going to say much about discourse analysis. Uh, I'm not going to talk about things so much like sociolinguistics, some of the so-called peripheral branches, but more core branches of these. Now, when you look at Samson's book, he talks about these categories. He uses categories like, he talks about the 19th century as a prelude. Then he deals with Ferdinand de Saussure. And the language is social fact. Virtually everybody's going to put so sore in there somewhere, right? Uh, then you have the descriptivists, he calls them. And that would be like Franz Boas, Leonard Bloomfield, Charles Hockett, Kenneth Pike, those kinds of people. Some of the early SIL people. He has a chapter on the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. Some of you will be familiar with that. Um, Edward Sapir, Benjamin Lee Whorf, his student, and the impact they've had, especially in biblical studies. Then he goes to the functional linguists of the Prague School. Then he deals with, of course, you're going to have to have a chapter on this, Noam Chomsky and generative grammar. Then relational grammar, Louis Helmsleff, Sidney Lamb, Peter Reich. Then generative phonology, then the London School of Firth and Halliday. So that doesn't sound a lot in some ways like what we do in New Testament studies, although there's some overlap. And it's more of a chronological study. It's a pretty full kind of study. But it only brings us up to 1980. And there's been a lot that has happened in the last nearly 40 years uh, since that time. The only similar study that I know that treats biblical studies in this regard is a, a chapter by Jeremy Thompson and Wendy Witter uh, that appeared called Major Approaches to Linguistics. And it is of some help, though I don't think it's actually in some ways a very balanced presentation of the issues and is a little uneven uh, in, in what it does. Some other ways that people have talked about this idea of linguistic schools, it's worth thinking about. Uh, Robert Van Valen and Randy LaPoya did a, a book where they distinguished two basic areas. They called it syntactocentric, the syntactocentric perspective, and then they called it the communication and cognition perspective. Okay, so if you look at Samson with eight or nine different categories going chronologically, now you suddenly have just two categories. And some of you will realize that these two categories that Van Vale and LaPoya use is basically Chomsky and everybody else, okay? Uh, so the Chomsky is syntactocentric. Everybody else gets put together. Well, that's one way of dividing the world. It's, you know, the sort of lumpers and splitters kind of way, I guess, of, of talking uh, about the world. Um, some have followed that, and there's some merit. I will not follow that. A guy named John Bateman uh, in the uh, Routledge um, Handbook of Systemic Functional Linguistics, he divides into four categories, talks about language, it's viewing language in terms of it being in contexts, in texts, in heads, or in groups. It's an interesting way of thinking about it, isn't it? Chomsky would be in texts, cognivists would be in the heads, right? And functionalists may be in contexts or groups. Uh, David Banks, he distinguishes between formal, cognitive, and functional ways of talking about linguistics. Now, I don't mean to overwhelm you with all sorts of different ways you can divide this pie up, but uh, what I'm saying is that there are various ways of thinking about how this might be organized. What kinds of groupings are we going to use? Because it has implications for certain things being seen to be more alike than less alike, similar to or different uh, from others. 
I'm going to use Banks' three-part analysis and then divide each of those into two parts once I get there. But before I do that, I want to, first of all, include as a school of thought what we might call traditional grammar. You think, well, that's, is that a linguistic school? Well, it really is in the sense that if we start with traditional grammar, we're starting with where we were before the so-called advent of modern linguistics. Sometimes when we use the term modern linguistics, we think that one day Ferdinand de Saussure woke up and decided, you know, I'm going to do something different in class today. I'm going to give these lectures on what's going to become modern linguistics. And uh, then that would have been some point time around 1910 or so. And then, you know, the sun shone brighter and it was a clearer day in Geneva when he did this. And suddenly we're in this new era of linguistics. Like nobody thought about language before that enlightened day. That simply is not true. People have thought about language in a variety of ways for a long time. And going back easily to, to the Greeks and, and possibly others. And so there were periods leading up to what we would call uh, modern linguistics. They often gets, though, lumped together, and I'm going to use this term, traditional grammar is sort of the head term for these two major pre-Saussurian periods uh, of discussion. But David Crystal, the linguist, he gives a good definition of what constitutes traditional grammar. And uh, so let me give you some of the things that he talks about, and you'll see, I think, that traditional grammar is in many ways alive and well in biblical studies today. And so you find, for example, he talks about the failure to recognize the difference between spoken and written language, emphasis upon restricted forms of written language, such as the Greek New Testament, a failure to recognize various forms of language and how they're used, Tendency to describe language in terms of another language, often Latin. Probably some of you have heard about that. Some of you even know some of the categories that have traditionally been used in talking about Greek, originated with the study of Latin, as if these were two languages, just because classicists think that they were going to talk about them and the Romans thought that they were the new incarnation of the Greeks, doesn't necessarily mean their one language should be used to talk about the other, but such is the case. The appeal to logic as a means of describing and even assessing language the tendency to evaluate languages as more or less logical or complex or primitive or beautiful and the like, okay? And so you'll find out that, of course, Attic Greek is the most beautiful language in the world, and isn't it wonderful, and that you should learn that best if you really want to learn Greek because that's the height of the development of the Greek language, which is a very traditional grammar kind of assessment. It takes one local variety of Greek, that would be what was used in Athens, especially during a particular time period, and because you happen to have certain significant intellectual figures who used forms of that language, that exalts the language. Well, if Plato and Aristotle and Thucydides and the tragedians had lived in Portland, Oregon, whatever the language was in 6th century BC would have probably been exalted as a fantastic language. I don't even know what that language was, uh, but probably an indigenous uh, American language, right? It happened to be the people who were writing in it, not a virtue of the language itself. All right, there are two periods in traditional grammar that are, are worth talking about. The first is the rationalist period. Uh, the first is the rationalist period. In rationalism, basically, we're talking about the time period from around, well, this is a little bit, you know, in the Enlightenment, really. It grows out of the Enlightenment around 1650 to 1800. Some would say 1798 for some of your things. 1798, what happened? I thought it was 1776. Uh, no, 1798, the publication of the preface to lyrical ballads, right, by uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge. And that's a sort of a marking point. But basically, the rationalist period... And rationalist period was given to this notion of rationalism, rational thought, rational explanations, empiricism, uh, anti-supernatural, emphasis upon naturalistic explanations of everything. Somebody like uh, Spinoza would have been a key figure here. Uh, there are lots of thoughts about language that took place during this time. There was a historical dimension to it, but it was sort of um, subsumed with this idea of rationalism. So you have various linguists here, and some of this is quotation. I won't indicate all the quotation all the time because it'll be distracting, but we're saying things in the grammar. It's one of the histories that I'm citing. He talked about um, 
abstract vocabulary growing out of or developing out of concrete uh, vocabulary, how language and thought are mirroring each other. One scholar, happened to be William Jones, a famous Sanskrit person from India, he called Sanskrit more perfect than Greek, right? More copious than Latin and more exquisitely refined than either. Now, that's a real value judgment on language, if there ever was one. Uh, James Harris seemed to think that you could get grammar, and grammar was actually related to ontology, and you got this especially from the verb, because the verb indicates sort of existence itself or something. You can wax philosophical about that. Uh, and you had a number of these kinds of thoughts going on. Well, where do we find that in New Testament studies? Well, we actually find it in a very, very well-known case of the rationalist grammar of Georg Benedict Wiener, W-I-N-E-R, Wiener, or some people will call him Weiner's grammar. Wiener uh, is the grammar. Um, Wiener probably is not very well-known anymore, except I think that his grammar is still available or still in print, translated into English uh, in the 1870s or so by James Hope Moulton's father, uh, W. Fidian. Moulton, William Fidian Moulton. Um, but Wiener wrote, wrote the first edition of his grammar in 1822, and then the last one, the sixth edition, appeared in his lifetime. There were some editions post his lifetime, but he didn't do them, obviously, in 1855. So he's a little bit behind the time period we're talking about, but he was a consummate rationalist. He even says that uh, in his grammar. He talks about the rational method that he is going to, uh, going to use. He talks about this notion of a, a single syntax that he has discovered and described and how this is the sure basis for exegesis, right? Very sort of rationalistic, empiricist, very scientistic in a way, right? If you do it right, you're going to come up with the sort of assured results that you really want. And uh, so he developed this approach. And so you find little odd comments where he states, for example, strictly and properly speaking, no one of these tenses, he's talking about the tense forms of Greek, can ever stand for another. Now, that's his rationalist grid in place, right? If you have time and kind of action, you have these little cells, and you have to fill all these cells in with various forms. But what happens when one form seems to be functioning outside of its cell? Well, he says it can never stand for another. Talking about the present tense form, it's being used for the future in appearance only. It looks a lot like a future in appearance. It's kind of a present in drag or something. Um, but it really is still a present tense form, okay? So that's this kind of rationalist approach to things. Now, how do we find that still going on in uh, New Testament Greek grammar? Well, it's interesting to note that... Uh, I'm old now, but when I was young, I thought that collecting first-year Greek grammars would be a fun thing to do throughout my career. So I started buying all these first-year Greek grammars. Well, I can't afford to buy all the new first-year Greek grammars that come out. You know, everybody's publishing two or three of them these days. And, but I went back to my shelves, and I have a good representative sample, probably, I don't know, 30 or so. And so I looked at them, and there are a few exceptions but the vast majority of them follow the rationalist approach to language, okay? They're very much time-oriented. They have little even frameworks or grids in them that tell you how to fill the different cells. Uh, they have this kind of thing going. And if you look at Machen all the way to Brad McLean and uh, Mounts in between, you have this tendency. However, you also have it in a number of the intermediate Greek grammars that we use uh, in New Testament studies today. And in fact, uh, you find it in, I'll mention two of them. I've mentioned the second one somewhat uh, with trepidation, but the first one is Dan Wallace's. The second is the one by Kirsten Berger et al. Uh, these tend to follow rationalist principles as well. Wallace, yes, uh, no, it was written, you know, in the, in the 90s, and so it is aware of some of the issues. But when he starts talking about things like undisputed examples and introducing diachrony again and taking sort of what I consider a non-systemic or systematic view of language and even a comment about the cryptic nature of language. I think we're not talking uh, about the same thing. The next period we'll talk about is comparative historicism. 
Comparative historicism took place, basically we can say the 19th century, after, you know, the 1800s and 19th century, up until Saussure, or thereabouts, right? 1916 was the publication of Saussure's book. Saussure didn't publish it himself. Remember, he dies. He has these students who take his notes and then turn them into this, uh, this book, which is really kind of an interesting idea to think this guy influenced this whole movement in a significant way. And he had no idea whether he, that was actually what he was talking about. But uh, it basically was heavily influenced by the rise of Romanticism. And it's the comparative historical view. So this is where you had the rise of lots of people writing grammars of obscure languages like a grammar of Old Norse, a grammar of Old English. Uh, the Grimm's brothers, like Jacob Grimm, right? You're familiar with the Grimm brothers because of their uh, bizarre German fairy tales, but they were significant linguists, especially Jacob Grimm, invented and found or discovered or described, I guess is better, some of laws of sound change that are considered some of the great accomplishments of this period. A guy named Franz Bopp, he did uh, work on the conjugation system of Sanskrit, Greek, Latin, Persian, and German. Uh, Humboldt was one of these, and it developed at its high point into something called the New Grammarians. And the new grammarians uh, were people like Karl Brugmann, Berthold Delbruck, this idea that there were these uh, ineluctable sound changes that took place. These sound changes took place without exception. And there would be studies of now individual sound changes or individual features of language, like study of a single case and looking at it in all sorts of different languages. You see the interesting thing about that. Let's say you have a case system in languages, but you're saying you're going to study the nominative case in all these different languages. The thing that's overlooked is the fact that the nominative case in a two-case system is going to function differently than the nominative case in a four-case system or a six-case system or an eight-case system. But in the comparative view, you took a look at nominative cases across the languages, especially historically as they had developed. Now, interestingly enough, in New Testament Greek studies, what do we find? We find that all three of the major reference grammars of New Testament Greek reflect the comparative historical period and were, in fact, written during that period. The first, Bloss, or probably better known as Bloss de Brunner Funk, originally written in 1896. It was published by Friedrich Bloss. Bloss himself was not a comparative philologian. He was a classical philologian. And there's a preface to his work that I don't think is published in the English editions. You have to go to the German to see this, where he thanks his teacher, uh, who was a comparative philologist, for all the teaching, but he notes that he's gone a slightly different direction. He's only gone in a slightly different direction. Uh, he's really pretty much in the sort of that comparative historical view. But then when De Bruyner takes over with the fourth edition, I think in 1913, De Bruyner was definitely a comparative philologian. And he continued that track. It's gone through some other revision. David Tabakovitz added some uh, material at the end. And then Friedrich Raykopf is doing the later editions. Funk translated the ninth and 10th editions. But that's essentially the same grammar that was published in 1896, OK? The second would be the grammar by James Hope Moulton. Uh, Moulton was trained as a comparative philologist at Cambridge was familiar with many of the big comparative philologists in Britain at the time. He published his Prolegomena that came out in 1906. He was working and had written about two-thirds of the second volume on word uh, accidents and word formation. But he had made a missionary trip during the First World War to India. Uh, he was a devout Methodist. He was coming back from his trip to, uh, to India. And he took a, a ship from Alexandria. He was crossing the Mediterranean. And he was killed because his boat was torpedoed by the Germans. He died in a life raft. Some of you are familiar with that story. Uh, his great friend, James Rendell Harris, was in the same lifeboat with him and wrote about that. Uh, later. But Moulton never got to see the completion of this project, but it was a major work of comparative philology because he was arguing that the language of the Greek of the New Testament found its closest parallel in the Greek of the documentary Greek papyri. Albert Deisman had been the one to make the discovery regarding vocabulary. Moulton was really the one who promoted the idea of grammatical similarity. And the third, the third comparative historical work would be the monumental grammar that many, I'm sure, are familiar with here, and that is the one by A.T. Robertson that was published in 1914, right? The famous grammar that almost bankrupted a publishing company. Um, 
handwritten, massive thing, and it reflects comparative historical approach. In fact, Robertson knows that because he says at one particular point on Roman numeral seven page that he was going to originally revise Wiener's grammar, but he recognized he couldn't do that because, quoting, so much progress had been made in comparative philology and historical grammar since Wiener wrote his great work. And so he goes on to write a grammar that very much reflects what he calls the modern period, and that is one that, that uh, uses the uh, comparative way of approaching things. We also have a few other works that continue in this mode to show you that actually the, uh, the traditional grammar, the comparative approach is in, still in fashion. Uh, Chris Karagounis' Development of Greek in the New Testament, David Hasselbrook's Studies in New Testament Lexicography seem to reflect that perspective uh, as well. So, lest you think that traditional grammar, including the two forms of rationalism and comparative historicism, have passed out of fashion, that is not true at all. It is still being used in New Testament studies. So when you pick up certain of these works, you need to know that they reflect that particular perspective. But now let's turn to some of the modern linguistic approaches, and we'll start with formalist schools. And formalist schools are concerned with the forms of language. They treat language as if it is a set of forms, sort of a, as one scholar calls it, linguistic algebra. Uh, and so there are two uh, schools of thought that I want to talk about in this particular area. The first is Chomskyan formalism. And uh, there used to be this saying going around, somebody said that the only linguist you'd probably expect to find on television was Noam Chomsky. Um, because Noam Chomsky is a well-known public intellectual whose political views are at least as well-known in some ways as his uh, linguistic views. And some of you will know of him as an outspoken uh, liberal libertarian. But Chomsky uh, developed a, a linguistic school of thought, very much in the formalist school, uh, under the influence of Roman Jakobson and his teacher at uh, University of Pennsylvania, Zelig Harris. So Zelig Harris is well known for so-called inventing discourse analysis, but basically he's concerned with the formal distribution of elements. That's what constitutes uh, discourse analysis for Harris. That was picked up by uh, Chomsky, Chomsky is known for a view of taking a thing called the autonomous cognitive faculty or universal grammar, the idea that everybody has this uh, built-in grammar uh, in, in their heads. He came up with basically um, emphasis of form over meaning in terms of his phrase structure grammar and the transformations that take place. He even calls it completely formal and non-semantic. Those are his own uh, words that he used uh, in his book, uh, Syntactic Structures. Uh, it wasn't until 1963 that one of these linguistic wars sort of broke out where some of his students and followers decided, we need to bring some meaning into this whole thing. And 1963, George Lakoff and some others published some things uh, that sort of modified that a bit. Now, in New Testament studies, there hasn't been that much in, in the Chomskyan mode. There was a little bit early on. Uh, with some scholars, and I'm only referring to English language scholarship. Uh, there's been some in Germany too, but in English language scholarship, you'd have Daryl Schmidt, uh, now deceased, who did a work on complementation using Chomsky's, uh, one of his theories. Uh, we had Johannes Lowe, who had kind of, he's from South Africa, so he did a little, some on, uh, kind of on his own, but he was concerned to uh, come up with a sort of constituent structure, breaking down units into their individual constituents, Become the, became the basis of a discourse analytic model, what he called colon analysis, which may not be the, uh, the term you want to use for it. Uh, and then Michael Palmer, uh, he did some, uh, some work with X-bar theory and this idea of projection of elements. And then things kind of died off for a while, and then it sort of recently was revived, maybe a little bit, whether it's a revival of a school, I can't say, but Robert Crellin in his book on the syntax and semantics of the perfect active and literary Koine Greek, he uses a form of Chomsky and linguistics as well as a neo-Davidsonian semantics. And for those of you who are familiar with Davidson's uh, you know, semantics, uh, it's very much in the analytic uh, tradition. And 
And so it would fit very much within that, that kind of, of Chomsky framework. But there's been little significant work that has been done using Chomsky uh, since then of this sort of work in mainstream biblical Greek New Testament uh, studies. And probably the reason for that is that this whole tension with the form and then the function or the meaning idea, most people in New Testament Greek studies are concerned with meanings. And they want to talk about meanings and functions of language. And so they uh, would want to have a model that would tend more towards that functional area. Uh, construction grammar is the second that I'll mention, and this is a little bit of an anomaly um, because a function, a construction grammar is really only promoted by one person today in, in New Testament study, but he's an avid promoter of it. Um, it's, I put it here as uh, based on Chomsky and linguistics because one of the people who worked it out was a guy named Charles Fillmore. Charles Fillmore was one of those people who sort of rejected Chomsky, was sort of connected with Chomsky, taught at Ohio State and then UC Berkeley, Fillmore did. He wrote a very famous article called The Case for Case, where he tried to shift the emphasis away from what we would call grammatical case to some kind of semantic or meaning case and identifying things like things are actors or beneficiaries or patients. That's a function rather than a nominative or accusative, which is a grammatical category. And Simon Wong uh, wrote a book using uh, that notion of case. But its fullest form came with, uh, when Lakoff uh, joined up with uh, Fillmore and a guy named Paul Kay. And they came up with this construction grammar and Paul Danoff has been the biggest promoter of it. And Paul has done, I don't know, um, four or five books using construction grammar. He's used it to talk about plot. He's used it to talk about character. He uses it for talking about just about every kind of phenomenon that he would uh, find within the Greek uh, New Testament. What he does with this construction grammar, or he calls it case frame analysis. He describes it as a descriptive, generative, non-transformational theory. He takes these things called predicators, and predicators are, are basically words that uh, license or regulate uh, other phrasal elements, and then he tries to create these things called valence description. And so you may have the, the thing that is acting on the thing that is acted upon, etc. Okay, and if you're interested in that, we can talk more about it. I th recommend that you take a look at one of his works if that is something you're interested in. But as I said, um, I think he's really the only one who's used that in a, in a significant way, but it's worth noting. It's, a, it's quite a model. I turn now to cognitive linguistics, and this is probably the fastest growing area of, uh, of linguistic thought, and um, it's kind of an encompassing thing. I'll say a couple things about it in, in assessment, but I break it down also into two things. So we have cognitive schools, basically concerned with cognition or thinking, tied in with the cognitive sciences. Many of you will know how important that has become. The first is the specific area of cognitive linguistics, developed originally in the 1970s. Uh, in some ways, I think it's a, a rebellion against sort of the, the Chomskyan way of thinking about things. Uh, the two linguists, Croft and Cruz, William Croft and Alan Cruz, say there are three major hypotheses that guide cognitive linguistics. And uh, I think that's worth thinking about. The, the, here is what they say, and quoting him here, they are these. Language is not an autonomous cognitive faculty. In other words, that's their rebellion against Chomsky, right, who sees it as this sort of thing. If you I guess cut in the right place in the brain, you'll un discover the brain, I mean the language uh, organ or something in there. But they say it is not an autonomous cognitive faculty. Uh, second of all, grammar is conceptualization. Okay, so it's conceptualization. It's not about sort of uh, like truth conditional rules or that kind of thing. And it's knowledge of language emerges from language use. And this would be the place where... In some ways, cognitive linguistics has ties to the third school that I'll talk about uh, in a minute, and that is the, uh, the functional way of approaching things. So basically, they say that it's not something to do with an organ in the brain, but it does relate to general principles of cognition, cognition how you think about things. It's not just about trying to formulate uh, rules or truth conditional abstract logic about things. Uh, but it actually emerges from, from use. 
Uh, Vivian Evans and Melanie Green, two other uh, cognitive linguists, they say that there are two fundamental commitments of cognitive linguistics, and they find these in George Lakoff. Remember Lakoff? We'll say a little bit more about him, but he was part of that whole thing with construction grammar as well. The first is what they call the generalization commitment. Okay, generalization commitment, quoting here that there are common structuring principles that hold across different aspects of language, and an important function of linguistics is to identify these common principles. And so they use such things as family resemblances or polysemy, metaphor, etc. And I'll talk a little bit more about metaphor in a moment. The second is the cognitive commitment. The cognitive commitment. Cognitive commitment says that principles of linguistic, quoting here, structure should reflect what is known about human cognition from other disciplines, particularly the other cognitive sciences, philosophy, psychology, artificial intelligence, and neuroscience. And one of the key things of cognitive linguistics is this notion of the embodied mind. And that, you can see, very important in the development of what has come to be called conceptual metaphor theory. Some of you will be familiar, perhaps, with Lakoff and Johnson's uh, work, Metaphors We Live By. And they use this notion of the embodied mind, and they show how many of our metaphors are related to uh, positioning in a body or other physical circumstances uh, around us. We want to get to the head of the class, right? There's the foot of the bed, uh, whatever, you know, your opinion you are varying from side to side, or whatever it might be. Um, these kinds of conceptual metaphor, and it's been developed further, and conceptual metaphor theory into things like conceptual blending theory. The shift was from semantic domain sort of to um, sort of these, uh, from domains to more of conceptual concepts, and then to this notion of integration. So you get lots of uh, movement among the metaphors. One of the classic examples that led to discovery of this uh, was this notion of the, the metaphor that, you know, that person is a butcher. Now, most people would take that as in some case, as a negative thing, right? If it's being used metaphorically, not describing the person who has a shop on the corner who chops meat, right? So, uh, yeah, he was a butcher. And why does that have negative connotations? Because there's nothing neg necessarily negative about being a butcher, right? Um, well, I was at the gym the other day, and a guy came in with a big wrapping on his hand, and, he, and somebody asked, what happened? He goes, well, I'm a butcher. And uh, there is something negative if you get your finger, uh, but it, not necessarily. Why would you think that's a butcher is a bad thing? Well, because there's conceptual blending going on where you have not just the notion of equating something with some kind of of profession or some kind of a doing something, but an also a negative judgment that is brought in as well. And that's where these metaphors uh, are, are blended uh, together. This has been an area of serious growth in New Testament studies. Many books in the last 10 years have appeared in New Testament studies. Very few of them about language itself, however. Bonnie Howe, wrote on 1 Peter. Uh, my own student, Beth Stovell, wrote on John's Gospel. She used some other theories as well. Jennifer McNeil on the infancy or nursing mother metaphors. Frederick Tappenden on resurrection used the body as a house metaphor. William Robinson, the spirit life is a journey metaphor. That's another kind of a typical thing. Life is a journey, right? It's hard and, you know, there are ups and downs. That's that kind of thing. Aaron Heim on adoption sonship metaphors. Greg Lanier using different Old Testament metaphors, etc. So there's a lot going on in New Testament studies with conceptual metaphor and its related offshoots, though very little actually done with the Greek language itself. Most of it is not really what you would think would be typically a Greek language. Why is that? What are some of the problems? Why is it that case? Well, uh, a lot of people would say that cognitive linguistics really is not an approach to language. So in that sense, not typically a linguistic model, but it is more of an approach or something that has, as one person calls, a set of guiding principles and assumptions from which people do things. Uh, so one person who's trying to talk about a grammar uh, for a cognitive framework in fact, the book is called Cognitive Grammar. It talks about grammar being symbolic. It means that the relationships are simply symbolic between whatever you may say and whatever those meanings uh, might be. 
Uh, Jeffrey Sampson, the linguist I mentioned earlier in a recent book called Linguistic Delusion, uh, has criticized in one of his chapters uh, some of the work that's going on in cognitive linguistics uh, for a number of different uh, reasons, one of them being that he doesn't think it necessarily works outside of English, where it's been primarily developed. He knows Chinese. He says metaphors function completely differently in Chinese, and so they wouldn't even use the same kinds of body-related metaphors that don't organize the same way. And he says also that once you get beyond um, this notion of embodiment, he's not quite sure what that, that actually means. Uh, but nevertheless, there's a lot of work being done in it. The second of the cognitive school, in this cognitive school, the second area, is relevance theory. And relevance theory developed uh, out of some work that was done by the British philosopher, though who was teaching at Harvard, called Paul Grice. And Paul Grice wrote in 1957 an essay uh, called Meaning, Meaning, which is kind of doesn't tell you a whole lot, but Meaning, it's supposed to be about meaning. And um, in that essay, he sets the groundwork for talking about an inferential rather than a code-based communication system. And so typically, linguistic models are code-based. Language is some kind of a code. He wants to talk about it being uh, inferential instead. 75, he came up with an article called Logic and Conversation. He outlined these sort of uh, Gricean uh, principles, conversational implicature, uh, they're often referred to. What is implicated when one engages in conversation? And he works from something called the cooperative principle, right? And people talk, they cooperate when they converse in terms of things like quantity of language. So if you say a lot more stuff, people are expecting all those details to be of relevance. You've probably engaged in conversation with people when they start going into all these details, and at the end, you wonder, what do all those details have to do with that? My sister used to come to talk to me about things one time. She has all sorts of details about it. And I finally said, what, what does this have to do? Well, nothing. I just thought you'd want to know all that. I didn't want to know it. Uh, I came up with this idea to tell her that I wanted the easy wash version of what she said because I just wanted the quantity of detail that was relevant to what she was going to say. Uh, quality. You expect certain quality. You expect people to tell you the truth. Right? When they converse with you. Relation. They expect things to be relevant. You know, have some relationship to what you're talking about and the manner in which they do it. So we work these things out. But uh, two uh, other linguists, Daniel Sperber and Deirdre Wilson, they took hold of some of these ideas the same time that uh, Grice was working. They published in 1986 a book called Relevance. Relevance. And basically they say, they, here's, they're trying to answer the following questions. Quote, what is needed is an attempt to rethink in psychologically realistic terms such basic questions as what form of shared information is available to humans? How is shared information exploited in communication? What is relevance and how is it achieved? What role does the search for relevance play in communication? So this principle of relevance, the human cognitive process is geared then towards relevance. And this has been widely used in translation studies. A number of works have done that, but also in some New Testament studies. Margaret Sim has done a couple of books on that, including fairly recently, 2016, sort of an introduction to relevance theory, if you want more on that. Uh, but Stephen Padamore has written a couple of books on the book of Revelation with that. Um, Nelson Morales recently on the book of James. And Joe Fantine has done uh, a couple of books that use relevance theory uh, as well. And one of them, he actually combines it with a, a theory from Sidney Lamb called uh, neurocognitive stratificational linguistics, uh, which is certainly a mouthful. But uh, if you know stratificational linguistics from Sidney Lamb, you'll know, know what he's doing there. Again, with relevance theory, the question is, is this a theory of language or is it more of a principle or theory of communication? And a lot of people view it as you need a theory of language and then you may have this as more of a theory of communication if you can make that kind of difference. Uh, but they basically have some interesting ideas of how, how a lot of our communication is based on underdeterminacy, and we have to sort of fill in the gaps and then inference. Uh, we infer a lot from what is said. Now, the final school that I'll talk about is functional schools of language. And there's some that I won't talk about here. At one time, the, the uh, brainchild of Kenneth Pike, 
a very, very famous linguist, used to be at the University of Michigan, uh, Tag Memix, and it was, uh, had some uh, currency for a while, especially in the form that his student, Robert Longacre, uh, took up and developed, but that sort of uh, tapered off. So I won't talk about that. I'll talk about two, two schools. The first is the cognitive functionalism. And cognitive functionalism is uh, it's kind of an interesting way. There have been a couple of, of significant books that have been written on it. Uh, neither of them actually uses the, the word cognitive in a real overt, specific, uh, definitional way. Um, but the first one is by Stephen Levinson. He's not going to be able to be with us. You'll hear him uh, through his surrogate, uh, Steve Runge, in the next session. Um, but he refers to another book that he did with a colleague uh, named Robert uh, Dooley, and that book uses the term functional and cognitive. Um, and it's directed towards discourse. And I think Steve's paper is actually on discourse. But, uh, and so in one sense, I wondered whether it should be included here, but I have uh, included it here. Uh, it's a little bit light on, on theory, um, but basically what it tries to deal with, it takes a Steve Levinson's book called Discourse Features in New Testament Greek, a uh, course book on information structure, on the information structure of New Testament Greek. He calls it descriptive linguistics which is a somewhat problematic term because descriptivism means a lot of different things. If you take it in its most extreme form, something like Bloomfield's sense, you're talking about behaviorism or mechanism. And uh, I think Steve means something much more robust than that, Stephen does. He calls his approach eclectic to the point where, for example, he doesn't hesitate to have uh, opposite conclusions from the theories of others. Uh, he's functional, structural, calls it choice, implies meaning, which if I understand him correctly, I think is a, is a very, very valid and important concept. And uh, his book's been followed by Steve Runge's uh, book on this topic. Uh, Steve basically follows the very similar kind of principles. I won't go into all of those, but uh, it's function-based, cross-linguistic, choice implies meaning is there, a distinction between semantics and pragmatics, that kind of thing. Uh, the question then, in summary, would be, is this a linguistic theory, um, or is it more a generalization, or is it more of a sort of a discourse, kind of, or in some ways limited discourse approach, because it focuses on what some of us would call the textual uh, function, the parts of how a text organizes itself, rather than some of the, the other components. But it's definitely uh, worth noting as one of the linguistic schools because of these two books. And I'll finish with systemic functional linguistics. And uh, systemic functional linguistic, it was mentioned by, uh, by Sampson in his survey when he mentioned London School. Somebody like John Firth, J.R. Firth, uh, with the an social anthropologist Bronislav Malinowski, uh, they were sort of some of the originators of it. But one of the key figures was a guy named Michael Halliday, recently departed. And uh, he picked up some of the principles from the Prague School, this notion of functions of language, especially developed by Carl Bueller, the well-known uh, psychologist, and developed this idea of, of SFL, be what became uh, systemic functional linguistics. Margaret Berry wrote a two-volume introduction to this, and I still recommend the, these books, even though they're written in the 70s, because they have a lot of good uh, material in them. And she identifies seven important, relatively widely accepted notions with SFL. And the first is it's sociological or communicative in nature. Second, it's concerned with linguistic behavior rather than being a form of knowledge of a language. Third, it utilizes different matrices for describing language. It doesn't try to force it all into one uh, matrix. So you have clines and ranks and strata and levels, which does get pretty confusing. The fourth is the notion of a text, not as a formal unit, but as a semantic unit. Okay, It's a unit of meaning rather than a unit of form. Fifth is that F SFL recognizes uh, various varieties of language and the notion of register. Uh, which has been a variety of language according to situation and context, and that's been a very productive notion in SFL. Three metafunctions, rather than just the function of language, but three different metafunctions are used. Concerns with ideas, the people involved, and the text as a, functioning as a text, what others would maybe call information flow or structure. And then it is concerned with both system and structure or the paradigmatic and syntagmatic organization. So SFL was introduced uh, by me and uh, another person, uh, my supervisor in linguistics, to New Testament studies in 1985. 
1989, I published my book on verbal aspect that has had some uh, influence on the field of talking about Greek language, but there have been a lot of others who have followed in the SFL mode. Uh, work, for example, by Jeff Reed or Gustavo Martin Asensio, Stephanie Black, Ray Van Nest, Todd Klutz, Cynthia Long Westfall, Matt O'Donnell, Ivan Kwong, Jay Hyun Lee, Beth Stovell, Greg Fuster, Wally Sirafezi, Chris Land, Brian Dyer, a number of others, and doing different things with them, sometimes concerned with metaphor, sometimes concerned with um, uh, questions of coherence and cohesion, sometimes concerned with a kind of a discourse model. Uh, admittedly, SFL is a very complex model. It's very diverse and in what it does. And, uh, but it does have some strengths, especially in notions of register and the notion of system. But in some ways, it is probably the most complex model to pick up because it differentiates between sort of a theory and an application part that uh, requires some, some getting used to. So, conclusion. Well, in conclusion, what is there to say about this? I know this has been a fairly uh, fast tour through some of these, and I apologize for that. Just be thankful that there aren't 22 different linguistic schools uh, to deal with. Um, but I thought I needed to cover all of the ones that I think are of, of current relevance, if for no other reason than to tell you that there is a, a fairly large number of schools of thought linguistic schools within contemporary New Testament Greek study. So we should be away from this positivist view that we're simply doing Greek, or when you pick up a Greek book, you know, should ask yourself the question, what approach is being used in this? Because the understanding of Greek is going to be determined by the linguistic model and the school attached with it that is used to write that book. However, on the other hand, the number of linguistic schools in New Testament studies is very limited when you compare it with what is out there in the wider field of linguistics. One study that I looked at had 16 different schools that would be used, and I could think of several others that were not even mentioned there. So uh, there are many other schools of thought. What is their relationship among them? Well, to some extent, there probably can be interrelation depending on how closely related they are in these three categories. So if you're within the formalist camp, you probably can understand a lot of the other formalists and there could be some easier crossover. Within the cognitive schools, the same would be the case. And within the functionalist schools, there would be similar kinds of identity. However, in that sense, there would be commensurability among them. But if you're talking about crossing big boundaries, I think you need to be cautious because I do think in that sense uh, you have sort of incommensurability, uh, the further away they are or distant within this cline. So I believe that if we learn anything from this survey, it must be the recognition that schools of linguistic thought are fundamental to our understanding and conceptualization of the Greek language. Those who think that they are simply examining the language probably hide much more than they reveal about their knowledge of Greek. But there's also plenty of scope for further theoretical development within the field of linguistics, including in the study of New Testament Greek. But those who are more explicit in their recognition of various linguistic schools, at least, I think, show awareness that the study of the Greek New Testament demands that we attempt to think clearly and critically about major issues in language using the best available linguistic tools. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. Thank you.